All right, well, for more on rising populism, let's bring in Jagjit Chada. He's a director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Rochelle. Now, Jagjit, what was your reaction to Theresa May's speech? Um, well, the speech um, earlier this week that she um, gave in, in London was, I think, very clear. Um, after the referendum uh, last um, in, in June, the British people voted to leave the European Union. Now, just to correct one thing that uh, your correspondent Jack said, we haven't left the European Union yet. We're going through a process of working out how we best leave. And the speech was very clear in that the UK is going to want to leave the single market and at the end of the previous process of negotiation with our European allies, take the, the resulting decision, the resulting settlement to Parliament for a final say. And I think that's entirely appropriate. The referendum we had last year was an advisory one, a very useful advisory one. We won't want to touch in a minute upon some of the reasons that the vote came out in the way that it did. Right. But it, it told our politicians we had to rethink where we were as a country. And I think that's what's going to happen over the next two years when we renegotiate our relationship with Europe and indeed, as you've already said, with the rest of the world. Now, let's unpack some of those issues. We saw that May really signaled sure. this hard Brexit, and she also stressed the downside of globalism recently. So then what does all this mean for the future of trade agreements? If you're a trade partner, what are you making of this? Trade um, agreements are fiendishly difficult to set. They're, they're done by people much smarter than me. They sit down and think about every good, every item, and what is the appropriate level of tariffs. The European Union itself is currently negotiating half a dozen, less than a dozen trade agreements. The UK is about to enter into negotiations once it has established its own independent status under World Trade Organization rules, negotiations with not only the European Union, but as you've already said, a large number of other countries. These will take a considerable amount of time. And that's why many people are thinking it may be appropriate to move towards some transitional arrangements. Not a final agreement, but a set of arrangements that will allow us to continue our arrangements over a longer time than the two-year limit imposed by Article 50, now, Judge, uh, Treaty 50. Rather. Now, uh, Brexit was certainly a wake-up call when it came to the populism that Absolutely. we then realised had been brewing. So what are some of the ways that populism mm. both hurts and perhaps in some cases could even help economies? Yeah, I, I think the populism idea, and you summarised it very well in your introduction, is becoming increasingly apparent in Western or advanced democracies. And you touched upon many of the reasons why. And I think the key reason is, in the post-war settlement, the political and economic settlement we arrived upon, in that period of the devastation in Europe after the World War II, we tried to generate continual growth, by which I mean year-on-year -year increase in income per head of the average person. Since the financial crisis, we've been unable to deliver that. There's a lot of reasons why that's the case. One is, primarily, low levels of productivity, which has meant that year on, there has not been, on average, year-on-year -year growth in incomes per head. If you've had a several generations in which that's been expected and it hasn't been delivered for 10 years, people will start to become dissatisfied. And we'd At the same time, the pot if I could just finish very, very quickly, at the same time, the policies that have been adopted by Western economies, those of low interest rates, have tended to raise uh, the wealth of those who initially old, hold assets. So there's been certain trend towards an increase in inequality. So you have a world in which people are not getting the returns in terms of income that they've expected in the past, and yet at the same time, they are observing, observing people who are wealthy increasing their levels of wealth. And I think that's the root cause of the populism trend that we're seeing in Western democracies at the moment. And we certainly saw that same wake-up call in the US with the election of Donald Trump. Yeah. So do Absolutely. some of the factors differ then? When we look at Brexit and say we look at Donald Trump, are there very different factors that were really playing a role in the rise of populism there? Yeah, I, I, I've got to say I'm not a, an expert on, uh, on America, but it's clear that there is a sense of dissatisfaction. When we look at the... the Let's look at the vote, the referendum vote last year. It's clear that areas in which people were older, areas in which people had lost their jobs to competing manufacturing industry, areas in which there were relatively high levels of recent migration, areas in which the uh, certification of education levels was, was lower, were all areas that tended to vote to leave the European Union. And I think of that as a protest vote. And in the same sense, I think a large part of what Donald Trump, president-elect,
was able to capitalize upon in his victory last year at, at the presidential elections in the US was that same level of dissatisfaction right. with the political economic settlement that we had established in the post-war period. Indeed. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us. Jagjit Chada from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research.